sends broadcast managers like right here on q3tv.com slash watch. Go to q3tv.com slash watch. Go to q3tv.com. Okay, hold on. Ready? Go to q30.com slash watch to watch broadcast breakdown. Go to q30.com slash watch to watch broadcast breakdown. Both men's and women's soccer had playoff games this weekend. Find out how they did, and is it officially time to worry about Quinnipiac baseball? All that and much more coming up on Bobcat Breakdown. Hello, I'm Heather Owen, and with me today are two of Q30's best, Jonathan Banks and Eric Kerr. Fellas, how's it going? I'm, I'm doing great. Fantastic out here at Bobcat Breakdown. It's going to be your last show today here, Jonathan Banks. Also, a battle of the uh, two broadcast managers, a mentee and a mentor, student versus the master, and I think I'm going to show you what's up today. You're going to show me what's up today. Well, I got old fashioned. I got my notes, got my pen and paper. You got these new things called iPads. You're, hey, you're technology is a wonderful thing. Down right now. So we'll let's see who see. gets it done on the paper here. I bet it's going to be me, though. Shh, doubt it. <laughs> let's get straight into it. Starting with the women's soccer team, who dropped their MAC semifinal game two to nothing to the Mammoth Hawks on Monday. Our very own Roberto Casillas has the highlights. You're going to see the highlights come. Mac Women's Soccer semifinal here in Hamden. Quinnipiac taking on the reigning champs, Mammoth Hawks. Here in the first half, Rebecca Cook tried to feed Gretchen Crone, but her header just went wide of the net. Now it's Mammoth's turn. Now it's Jesse Rosman with a pretty play. Hesitation with a shot, and Sofia Lospinoso, the first year goalie with a good save to keep the game tied here in the first half. To the second half we go here, Lauren Carabin gets away from Katie Schwartz and then belts one to the far corner and the champs take the lead. Nothing Los Pinoso can do about that one. Mama leads 1-0 less than two minutes into the second half. The Bobcats would try to answer though. Selena Salas with a corner. People in the box try to head it in. Rebounds all over the place and Flora Cordier smashes it into the crossbar. Big chance for Quinnipiac to get back into level terms, denied by the crossbar. Here, Lauren Carabin once again finds Lauren Bruno, and Bruno with a nice move, and then just puts the finishing touches on a Monmouth win. The champs will go on to play the Siena Saints to try to get their fifth consecutive MAC championship title this Friday. So guys, now that you've seen the highlights, what do you think went wrong for the Bobcats? Eric, let's start with you. Well, Heather, I think the answer is simple. You saw it in the final score. It was 2-0 Mammoth, and to that point, the offense was not great for this Quinnipiac women's, bas uh, women's soccer team. Basketball. Excuse me. I was going to get the soccer. The wasn't great. Soccer, they zero soccer. But anyway, um, so they didn't score a single goal in that game, obviously. And even in the first matchup of the playoffs, they didn't score a single goal until overtime against Fairfield in that first round. So 
clearly the lack of scoring to show through there. And, you know, that was even in the regular season two banks. In the last three wins of the season, uh, Monmouth, they won one nothing. They didn't even uh, play against Niagara. That was a forfeit. And then Fairfield was also just a one nothing victory. So, you know, players like Rebecca Cook can only do so much for this team. Team leader in goals with four season, but no one else had more than one goal this season. I looked at someone like Selena Salas, for example, who had six goals last season. Granted, there are less games, so there isn't you know, as much opportunity for these players to go out there and get some, some goals for the team, but it can't just be one person, right? It's, it's gotta be everyone you know, contributing off on the offensive side because you, can, you, you can't keep putting this pressure on Sofia Espinoza in goal to try to get all these saves and save the team. You can't just score one goal and win. You have to, you have to score. Well, in soccer, you can score one goal and win a lot, and that's what happens. And that's what happened when Fairfield was sitting back and playing them differently. And, yes, that's a good point you made. Rebecca Cook scored, I think, half of Quinnipiac's goals this year. That can't happen. But what went wrong against Monmouth? Nothing went wrong. It was just collectively how the team lost. They showed they could beat Monmouth this year, but on the day, Monmouth was the better team. They forced Quinnipiac back. And then Quinnipiac were the ones that had to defend their own goal on countless occasions because they couldn't progress the ball through the creative spaces in the middle of the park. And Monmouth were just there. It wasn't one thing. It was that Quinnipiac didn't put in a required performance because Monmouth was just better yesterday. And I think the real jinx here is that Jack Main celebrated a little too quickly on Twitter with that victory lap about a month ago about Quinnipiac and Monmouth. And you look at it now, Monmouth beats Quinnipiac when it counts. And Dave Clark also talked about this. It wasn't that Quinnipiac played badly. It was that they didn't play as well as they did all season. And that would mean that mom was just putting a better performance. Hey, the day. journalism business is a risky business. So anytime Jack Mead had the chance to expose you for, for one little take, which I actually agree with you. I thought volleyball had a good chance to win. Uh, but regardless, you know, you got to take what you can get. But yeah, no, I do agree with you. You know, offense was obviously a big thing, but there are, you know, a lot of things that can contribute to a team losing a soccer game. And, you know, I think mom just had the right stuff and Quinnipiac just simply did it, especially in the offensive side. Absolutely. Despite their disappointing loss to Monmouth, there were plenty of positives to take away this season, including the emergence of first-year Rebecca Cook. So Banks, do you think this season was a success? It was a success in the sense that they played a bunch of games and went 4-1-1, and including a forfeit win, but they didn't get any further than they did last season. They lost to Fairfield in 2019 in the MAC semifinals, 1-0 at Fairfield. And then this year, where were they again? They were in the MAC semifinals against Monmouth. And then you look at 2016, they lost in the MAC championship. You look at 2017, they didn't get to the MAC semifinal. This isn't the type of program that just wants to get into the playoffs and show up, and that's all that they came for. Yeah, it's a success in the sense they played through COVID. They went 4-1-1. One, and, one. and look, and yes, they had Rebecca Cook. They found her as a first year. That was really good for them. But in general, they, they think they should have achieved more. They had a really good chance here. Monmouth is in the MAC final, but Monmouth had a down year as a number three seed. When's the last time Monmouth was a number three seed, Eric? It's very, very It's rare. never happened never before. Happened. They've never been a number three seed, and they beat Quinnipiac and Hamden. So when it comes down to this, there was a window of contention here for the Bobcats, and they didn't take it. And they did have a really good regular season. I don't want to take that away from Dave Clark's squad, but when it comes down to it, they didn't take advantage of an opportunity and they probably think they could have achieved more. Yeah, I think, you know, every team, the ultimate goal is to get to the championship, no matter, you know, if you finish number one or number eight right. in the MAC, because anything can happen, right? But I'm looking at, at this in terms of kind of a season to season basis, okay? 2019, you know, I, you know, I'm not as good as they finished this year, number five seed, 10 8 one record overall. Granted, they, you know, they played a couple extra out-of-conference games, but I noticed of the first three out-of-conference games that the women's soccer team played, those were all wins against teams like Rhode Island, Bryan, and Loyola. But anyway, getting into this season, they finished as a number two seed, so that's already improved. Uh, they won their first round playoff game against Fairfield, getting their revenge from last year after losing to them in, in the second round in that, in that regard. Um, but, you know, obviously, they would have didn't get as far as they would like. They lost to Monmouth. They did beat them in the regular season, so that, that is a good thing, but they weren't able to get it done in crunch time when it mattered most. And, you know, considering, obviously, you mentioned COVID, the fact that Megan Phillips was battling injury all season. Uh, as I talked about earlier, a little bit of a down year for Selena So are you Salas, saying it's a successful season? I think so. Because based but on success the... success is measured by progress. What progress did the team the make in the playoffs? They, they've had a better regular season. That was the progress that they made. But you don't, Pro come, you don't come to Quinnipiac to win regular season titles. You win to get to the NCAA right. tournament. No, that's fair. But like, if you're building on getting success over, you know, over time, right. this is a good setup for that. And you know, playoffs-wise, they finished the same spot they did last season, right? They lost in the semifinals. In the semifinals. So maybe next year it's... A, it's to keep building up. They get first seed in the conference, and then they make it to the finals, and then who knows what happens next year. Right, and I think Dave Clark's a fantastic coach. That, that's a good point. But in a six-game season, they were the second seed. Would they have done it over a regular schedule? I personally don't think so. Yeah, we'll have to see you next year, then. 
Now moving over to the men's side of soccer, Quinnipiac had 24 shots and just one goal in their playoff win against Siena. Does their lack of finishing worry you as they move forward? Eric, I'll pass it to you. Uh, I wouldn't say so, uh, basically because, you know, every team has their bad game, and to have it in a, in a time against the number eight seed Siena, you want to have that in the playoffs. Get the rust out of you, get ready for the next matchup coming up, because we've seen it this season, they are a, a, a very good goal scoring team, number one in the MAC in both goals and goals per game, and they also get a no, good number of shots on net, number three there with 14.57 per game, and, you know, Again, they, they did beat that Siena team earlier 4-1 this year, so I think it was just kind of a, uh, a fluke for that team to only score one goal. But I think the next playoff match coming up, they're going to really come out uh, guns blazing. They're going to be ready. They're going to be hungry and ready to fight. I think, you know, one game is just uh, shouldn't be defining the example of how this team normally plays based on the prior numbers. Right, so you're not worried. No. Yeah, because this question is, is something that I think shouldn't be asked because if you watch that game, Quinnipiac had so many shot attempts, and what did they do? They played against a coach who was a former All-American at Quinnipiac, that coached at Quinnipiac for the last few years, and he knew exactly what they were going to do. He man-marked their best player. They played against a team that sat back and absorbed a lot of pressure, and their goalkeeper, Greg Monroe, made a ton of great saves. And with the Bobcats, 16 goals this season from nine different goal scorers. And Siena just sat back. They absorbed a lot of pressure. The Bobcats didn't even play badly. They just couldn't put the ball in the back of that. They probably should have scored three or four goals, if that, in this matchup against Siena. So when it comes down to it, the free-flowing attack that they've employed with that, with the loss of Eamon Whalen, one of the best goal scorers the team has ever had, they have about six guys, you can say, they can put the ball in the back of the net. Mm -hmm. And against Siena, one of them did, David Bersedo. But besides that, there's no worry at all in what the Bobcats are doing. They played their game. It was the playoffs. And when, when you're a number eight seed and you come to a number one seed, what are you going to do? You're going to sit back and you're going to make them beat you. Yeah. So I'm not worried at all about the Bobcats because Fairfield's a team that they have pride. They want to play out from the back. They want to possess the ball. And they're not going to sit in a low block and let Quinnipiac attack them. They're going to step out, and that'll be better for Quinnipiac to have those spaces behind. So I think when it comes down to it, I'm not worried one bit about Quinnipiac's lack of finishing because they didn't score five goals because Siena's goalkeeper was very good. Exactly. And as you mentioned, usually the lower seed will, you know, in those situations, play more conservatively because they may not be as athletic, as athletic or as skilled. So that is a good point why Quinnipiac wasn't able to get as many goals as they would have liked. And, you know, I think going into a game against Lake Fairfield who's, who's more aggressive and more willing to attack, I think we're going to see a, a much better game coming up soon. Yeah, I like the lower third, by the way, shooting their shot. Whatever producer put that up there. That is fire. I like that. I did I have like to look that. at the TV for that, but that was, <laughs> that was fire. Up next for the men's soccer is a date with the Fairfield Stags for a trip to the MAC championship game. And it's time to get our analyst pick for the game. Banks, who you got? This is going to be a really good one. And to get more insight today, I talked to Matt Jones, the, the lead assistant coach for the Bobcats team, also talked to Brog Austin. And Jones assured me. Wow, you got your they, sources out here. I got my sources out here. When I come on a Bobcat breakdown, I come 110%. I'm ready to go. But I talked to Matt Jones today. He assured me they wouldn't take Fairfield lightly because that first game, it was a tough game. It was a gritty game. Quinnipiac won in overtime. And it isn't lost on them, too, that Ryder – and Iona celebrated on their home field in the last two seasons Quinnipiac played. And Brog Austin said he wants Fairfield to play. He wants them to come out and attack. And he wants them to possess the ball. And he wants them to try and play. And the Bobcats are ready for that. The last time, Eric, before you pick the score, so I'm almost helping you, the last time a men's soccer playoff game has been a more than one goal game in the playoffs was in 2016 when Quinnipiac beat Canisius 3-1. So you know it's going to be a grind. It's going to be a dogfight between two in-state rivals. And I got Quinnipiac winning this one 1-0. Before the facts, I absolutely agree with you with the scoreline. I actually had 2-1 Quinnipiac gotcha. in mind. And I'm also actually going to pick your source, Brog Austin, as kind of my, my key player. You know, Obviously, team leader in both goals and assists. And in that first matchup they played against Fairfield back in the very first game of the season, he got the lone assist of that game too. So you better expect him to be contributing out there again. And you know, obviously, as we talked about earlier, uh, I think Quinnipiac wins this game simply because they, they are skilled. As you mentioned, Fairfield will attack. The rust is shaking off. They're ready to go. This one is going to be a tight matchup, but I'm really looking forward to seeing this one coming up on Wednesday. Yeah, and tomorrow, when, I actually. when I talked to Brog today, I said, you've been playing really well. He scored two goals in, in two of his last three games. That's four goals in three games. And I said, you've been looking really good out there. And he says to me, I don't think I'm playing well. I'm just getting in the right spaces. And I found that really interesting because I agree with you. He's going to be a difference mm -hmm. maker because Sienna man marked him out of the game. And that caused a lot of Quinnipiac's other attackers to be wide open and to take that space 
in behind the midfield and the defense. So Brog doesn't think he's playing well, but he is doing a great job out there so far, especially in the last three games. And again, Siena did his job. He's important for this team. So I, I do think that he's going to be one to step up to. A few other players as well, but Brog Osman can have a lot to say in this result. Yeah, it's always good for any guy to be hard on themselves in the sports world. And I think, you know, of course, exactly. And I think it's only going to help them come out on top. Good points. Now it's time for a quick break, but stay tuned because next up we'll be talking baseball, basketball, and lacrosse. Don't go anywhere. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a unique mix of all kinds of things. Come on, Drew, spot on this last one. Uh, there it is. Keep going with it. Leo! <laughs> they're a little bit of a lot of things, but they're all pure love. I know what you're thinking. I need a job. I need a new career. Well, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. After high school, I didn't have a plan. I just wanted to start working. I got laid off twice. But you got to keep going. You just need the right skills. Find an apprenticeship. I found a two-year IT program. I found a medical course online. I'm now a consultant in the tech space. You have more options than you think. You can do this. You will find something. You will find something new. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes! Sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20-mile radius. Home sweet home. You aced house hunting. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Welcome back to Studio 125. Thanks for sticking with us. Let's get into it. Some men's basketball. The Bobcats officially said goodbye to Seth Pinky, Pinkney this week as he committed to play at FIU this next season. In your opinion, where do you think the best fit was for Seth Pinkney? QU or FIU? Jonathan? I'll take this one first. Now, you were with the basketball team more. But FIU is the obvious answer here because if you want to be the guy, that is the place for him. Yes, he's going to a better conference, but he's going to a worse team in that conference as FIU finished in the cellar of Conference USA. But he, he gave it as his shot at Quinnipiac this year. And then Kevin Marfo, the nation's leading rebounder, is coming back. Yes, Pinkney and Marfo showed they could coexist together and they could play together. But if you're an alpha, if you want to be the guy... Like, I know, I want to be the guy. I want to be the best at everything I do. Eric, I know you're the same way. You're motivated. Yep. If he comes back to Quinnipiac, yes, he could be productive. And, yes, he could be a good part of a winning team. But he would be playing second fiddle to Kevin Marfo, who's going to get all the plaudits, all the headlines, and, most importantly, more of the playing time. So I think FIU was the right choice for him. Was FIU the best choice out of all the options? I have no idea. I don't know all the schools on the transfer portal that wanted Seth Pinckney. But for him to leave Quinnipiac to go to FIU, that says everything about him wanting to be an important player on his team. And at Quinnipiac, he probably just wasn't feeling the same way when Marfo came back. Yeah, no, I mean, for my, for my take, um, I would, for, out of the two, and I, you know, I, I know a couple of other schools that were in the, the transfer portal as well. Like, you know, you talk about West Virginia. Well, he, so he wouldn't have interest. played at West Virginia. They were a three seed in the NCAA tournament. Right, you're right. But it was, it was some rumors. It was rumors right, around. Right. But out of the two options, I'm actually going to go with Quinnipiac here. Um, the main reason, as you kind of touched upon earlier, they have showed that they could coexist together. And I think Baker could have run a really, really huge lineup for the Mac that Seth Pinkney could have been a part of, if you wanted to say, with Marfo and Pinkney together. Because, you know, you have Marfo, who's you know, not only the nation's league rebounder, but he even developed his abilities to extend beyond the arc and knock down some triples. So you could put him in that fourth spot, still run Baker's four-out one-in offense that has worked pretty well for this Bobcats team, and have Pinkney just be the guy that handles all the down-low stuff. Getting those rebounds. But does he want to do that? 
I, I get that he doesn't want to do that, but I think it's a decision he shouldn't make because, I mean, looking at FYU, FIU, you mentioned it, they're like a bottom seller team in another mid-major conference, and I just but don't think he'll be able to. But also the nine seed here. It's not like he's on a team that's much better. He's on a team. He's going to a team in a better conference that's worse. Also, and, and I, I'll let right, you but at least put PX one more games. They've won two games in their conference. They Garden. did, but guess two. what FIU is doing? They are graduating all of their front court. So Seth Pickney is going to get to go to sunny Florida, and he's going to get to play 40 minutes a game. And if that's what he wants, if he wants to be the alpha, he can definitely do that. So with Quinnipiac, you, and your point is valid that they can coexist together. And I don't think there are any problems with what's going on between Pinkney and Warfel. I think he just wanted to be the guy. Yeah. And if you truly want to be the guy, go to where you're going to be the guy. It doesn't matter if you're in the MAC and you're in Conference USA. If you're on a bad team in the conference, or if you're on, let's face it, an average team in the conference. So if I'm Pinkney, I'd rather go to a worse team in a better conference and play every big minute and every big moment. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the decision was made based on he wanted to be the guy. Right. But I think the better decision would have been, out of the two, to stay at Quinnipiac just because of how well he could have been able to play with coexisting with Hyde Marble. But that, that's just my opinion. No, I, I can't control Seth Pickney's like decisions. <laughs> I would hope you would. <laughs> <sighs> Switching gears over to the baseball diamond. The Bobcats are currently 4-14, four and 14, sitting in 7th place in the MAC at the halfway mark of the season. So guys, are you worried about them making the playoffs? Yeah, I was worried, you know, before this, this Siena series, just because of you know, how not good that we've, we've seen them, right? How like, not good, correct. Yeah, yes. not good is, I'm not going to try, try to say the, the B word, but, um, you know, they, they just haven't been that great. B word is bad, by the way. Just call Yeah, it. that was, that was yeah, thank you for saying it for me. <laughs> um, but anyway, the main problem has just been their pitching all year. That's been the, the number one problem. They are ninth in the MAC in the ERA, and that out of 10 teams, that's second last. So n not good at all. 6.5 ERA. Only the worst team is Siena, who the Bobcats did split with them this weekend, but both of those games were extremely high scoring, showcasing, you know, how, you know, not so good those, those pitchings are, pitching is. They are the first in the MAC in runs allowed at 124, and they are also the first in the MAC in hits allowed, and with that run stat, they have allowed more than five runs in six out of the last seven games. You know, you can't expect to win baseball games if you can't pitch. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you said a lot of stats there, and those all ring true. But I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put it to you like this. Colin Donnelly, one of the relievers, probably the best reliever on Quinnipiac's baseball team, met with his team before the Siena series and said there has to be some accountability. You heard the numbers from Eric. Their bullpen has an ERA over nine. Their starters' ERA is over five. That has to change because the bats on this team are too good. The lineup is too good to just get destroyed by a subpar bullpen every time. And when you're the Quinnipiac baseball team, you have that championship DNA, if you will, getting to the NCAA tournament. So they have to clean that up. I will say I am worried, but with the top eight qualifying in the MAC for baseball, I'm not worried that they won't get in, to be honest, unless they, unless they, if they play the way they played in the first half of the season, let's call it like it is, mm -hmm. they won't make the playoffs. But right now I think they're okay. They just gotta, they're, they gotta be better yeah. pitching. And also their team defense has to be better. Their second errors in the match. The hitting is too talented. They were ranked yep. number one in the preseason for a reason. So hopefully the bats come alive and the pitching starts to come alive for them. Let's switch to another spring sport, men's lacrosse. Quinnipiac currently sits second in the MAC, despite their offensive struggles is continuing to win game defensively sustainable come playoff time. Eric? Well, the defense has been great with men's lacrosse, but this weekend really showed just how good this offense can be. They took down a Manhattan team in overtime, double overtime actually, 13 to 12. Uh, and against this Manhattan, it was against Manhattan Jasper's team that was number second in the, or number two in the least amount of goals allowed in the MAC per season, 8.33. So, to show, to show that you can put out this type of scoring output against a team that is one of the top defensive uh, teams in the MAC in Manhattan, that's a good sign. It shows that the offense is starting to come alive. But I guess to answer the question, yes, the defense can, can be sustainable as long as Nick DiMuccio is still in goal because he has been on fire for this team in season. Number two in the MAC in both save percentage and goals allowed, and also number three in lowest goals allowed per game. And he is, you know, has that experience entering his junior year or currently in his junior year now at Quinnipiac. I think with him and him between the net and the offense starting to pick up, I think men's lacrosse could be starting to head up in the right direction. Yeah, I was actually waiting about 25 to 30 seconds for you to, to get to the question, but it was in there. <laughs> it was in there. And yes, of course they can. You see the lower third defense wins championships. And, and Eric talked about the offense. And yes, the offense is underrated in the sense that they only have two less shots than their opponents and five less goals. So it's not like this team isn't offensive, but their defense is elite, not just in net, 
45 more ground balls than their opponents, and also 30 more turnovers forced than their opponents. They can get it done all over. And of course, Dimitri, uh, Dimitri George in, in the faceoff X, second in the country in faceoff percentage. And that is huge to instigate attacks for the Bobcats to make sure you're defending from the front and not inside your own zone. So it's really important for the Bobcats to get that. But I got what you're saying, and I do agree because it is sustainable because the, the older Dodge goes. You see it up there. Defense, Defense with championships. championships. You exactly. Said it exactly. Couldn't say any better. Time for one final break. But don't go anywhere. We have some final roars you won't want to miss. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just going to drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh, man. A selfie. Ah! Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man. Let's put a ride home. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. What? What? My. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back. Before we get to final roars, it's time to look back at this week's QBSN Game of the Week. This week, we take you back to Quinnipiac men's soccer first round playoff matchup with the Siena Saints. Despite Quinnipiac's 24 shots, the Bobcats and Saints were locked in a scoreless battle until the 78th minute when David Bercedo scored game, the game winning goal. Doman Bozik played the ball into the box where Verse Doe took one touch, turned, and fired one into the left side of the net, putting away his third goal of the season. Let's take a listen to the game-winning goal Jonathan Banks had the call for us, QBSN. The Bobcats will move on to the MAC semifinal game tomorrow against the Fairfield Stags. The match is set for 3 p.m. Good touch from Doman Bozic to drive into the space. Doman Bozic with the great run here towards Bersedo. Can he get out of his feet? And he does! David Bersedo, this is your day! As he scores a brilliant goal off a deflection, and it flies in for a 1-0 lead for the Bobcat. It's finally that time of the night. Final roars. Eric, take it away. Student media has provided several homes for me on campus. One, obviously, is Q30. But another home that is close to me is this show's sponsor, QBSN. I was recently awarded as one of two of its broadcast managers. And it still feels a little weird to know that myself and fellow broadcast manager Griffin Cass will be QBSN's next top broadcast guys instead of my fellow analyst alongside me tonight, Jonathan Banks, and his broadcast managing partner, Stephen Pappas. Both have done so much work over the past two years to ensure members can grow in their sports broadcasting abilities and skills. COVID-19 presented a unique challenge for QBSN radio calls without being inside of the arena. But both managers stepped up and continued to provide broadcasts for several Quinnipiac games this season. 
their determination to keep running broadcast is a trait that resonates within me. I know Griff and I are both determined to help the organization grow, and we not only want, want to provide feedback and instruction to aid in the growth of uh, each, each and every member and broadcaster of QBSN, but also seek for the opportunities of, of joint collaboration with all student media organizations. One idea includes the creation of Q30 Sports Rebound segments where QBSN broadcasters are the, uh, are the talent. And you know, there's no doubt that my mentors will be missed, but I'll make sure as their mentee to keep their legacy going. I'm sure you're all used to hearing the seniors talk about how much they love being a part of Q30 and how they will miss, all, miss it all next year. That may be true for them, but being a first year myself, I look forward to all that I have. I will miss the seniors with all my heart as they have taught me a lot and have become great friends of mine, especially my co-producers, Ryan Flaherty and Liz Flynn. Now switching to a happier topic, with games finally being able to have people attend, I am overjoyed. I'm thrilled to finally get to experience just a bit of what everyone has been telling me I've missed this past year. Though things aren't completely normal, I've gotten to see firsthand the real Bobcat spirit. Hopefully next year we'll be back to normal and I'll be able to fill the stands with all the other excited fans to cheer on our athletes like once before. We're not quite done, but before we go, you can catch Bobcat Breakdown Tuesday nights at 9.30. Follow, on the la follow the latest on Twitter at Q30Sports and at QBSN. And check our website, theqbsn.com and q30tv.com. Thanks to the hardworking crew behind the scenes and talents tonight. It was another great show, and we're not done yet. For one last time, Banks, take it away. Wow, I, I get my own setup here, and not even the camera zoomed in, so that's how you know it's real, but my final time here on Bobcat Breakdown, and it might not be the same for anyone else in this room right now, but Bobcat Breakdown changed my life, and I hope that comes across in the next minute. I joined Breakdown three weeks into my first year because I saw professional development opportunities flying off the walls, and yet, when I walked into my executive producer interview in this exact room with a list of 33 segment ideas printed out late that year, and I was crazy for doing that, but it's because I wanted to leave this show for a different reason. I was shown by my mentors that you get out what you put into student media, and I took that to heart. I wanted to prove to them that they didn't waste their time putting their faith in me. I'll mention Tom Krasnowski by name, not a mentor to clarify as I would hate to confuse that, but he was my running mate here. No one truly knows the half of how committed we were when creating the 2018-19 Q30 Show of the Year. Besides Tom, I loved working with those who became close friends, and others I tried my best to mentor, and that was the most fulfilling part of this experience. Also pretty great, I wouldn't have met my best friend in the entire world without this show. It's only fitting my last words on Bobcat Breakdown are from where my brainstorming sessions always started, and that's on the notes section of my phone at 3 a.m., except this time, no changes were made the next day. I can't possibly fit all my thoughts into one final roar, but thank you, Bobcat Breakdown, for everything. I hope I left you in a better place than I found you. <laughs>